Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear students and faculty members, dear friends and guests of the American University Kiev. Uh, welcome to yet another exceptional session uh, of the so-called uh, AUK Talks. As you know, this has become, over the last couple of years, uh, the premier uh, venue online and offline uh, for gathering uh, really the, uh, the creme de la creme, uh, the, the cream of the crop, uh, as we say, of uh, uh, world leaders, uh, be it uh, uh, in the field of diplomacy, politics, uh, military affairs, um, also academia, uh, and and other uh, spheres of uh, of life uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so tonight, uh, I have the distinct privilege to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Stephanie Babst, um, who will uh, present her uh, extremely thought-provoking book. Um, Zend and August with the English title Blind Spots. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, Dr. Bobs, uh, allow me to introduce her briefly. Um, uh, Stephanie has uh, has had a tremendous uh, uh, career uh, spanning uh, a couple of decades, uh, primarily at NATO. Um, she uh, spent 22 years at NATO at various positions in the public diplomacy division. Uh, and then in uh, 2006, uh, she was appointed to lead uh, 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 to lead as NATO Deputy Assistant Secretary General uh, for Public Diplomacy, uh, which uh, made her the highest ranking German uh, woman in the International Secretariat uh, of NATO. And then from 2012 to 2020, uh, she led NATO's strategic foresight team, uh, which was an amazing civil um, military relations team advising the NATO Secretary General and the Chairman of the Military Committee on the strategic unknowns and the potential upcoming crisis situations in, uh, geo in across the geopolitical and functional areas that are of relevance uh, to the Alliance. Uh, Stephanie began her career uh, back in 1991 as Assistant Professor for International Security Policy uh, at uh, the Christian Albrechts University in Kiel, Germany. Uh, and then she moved on to become professor of Russian and Eastern Bu European Studies at the Federal Armed Forces Command and General Staff College in Hamburg. Um, Stephanie is uh, an international rec renowned strategic advisor, uh, publisher, and speaker on a range of international security issues. And she's also a board member of uh, various councils, uh, think tanks, such as uh, the German Council on Foreign Relations, uh, also uh, centers in Denmark and, and Norway uh, and others. Um, she's extremely uh, active in various security uh, networks, including women and international security and the World uh, Economic uh, Forum. And of course, the um, also she's very active in the, the, in the, in the London-based European leaders uh, net, networks. Uh, she has received many awards, state awards, in recognition of her professional achievement. And in, 2000, in 2022, uh, Stephanie was formally recognized as one of the top 100 leading female leaders in Germany. Uh, earlier this year, in April, actually, um, Stephanie published, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the book uh, Zend and August, uh, you know, which you know translates best in English as the blind spots, uh, with the subtitle "Why the West Must Have the Courage to Alter Its Strategy Towards Russia." Uh, this book uh, has attracted wide international attention. It has been published already in uh, Estonian and in Ukrainian. And I would like to break the news here uh, that we at the American University of Kiev uh, are privileged uh, to be given the opportunity uh, by Dr. Babs, by Stephanie, uh, to actually distribute her book in the Ukrainian translation for free to the Ukrainian audiences, uh, which uh, um, you know we will start doing um, next month in December, uh, after we finalize all the details and uh, negotiations. Uh, so this is fantastic news. Um, uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for, for the, your generous offer. Uh, as I said, this is a privilege and an honor uh, for us. Uh, so with this, uh, I, I would like to give you the floor uh, to lead us on, on a, what I believe would be a whirlwind tour. Uh, obviously, it all started historically on... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. February 22nd, 1946, when an American diplomat, uh, a, a, a great expert on Russia, uh, George Kennan, who was then the Chargé d'Affaires uh, at the American Embassy in Moscow, wrote the so-called 
a long telegram, a telegram consisting of 8,000 words, which was sent to the State Department, in which he out outlined a plan uh, how to respond to the growing threat of uh, Stalinism and uh, the Soviet uh, and, and, and the counter, containing counter the Soviet aggression in Eastern Europe, uh, which uh, later became uh, known, this strategy became known as the containment strategy. Uh, to many in Europe, I'm sure uh, this is sounds like ancient history that was uh, almost 80 years ago. And from our discussion, uh, you kind of suggested that many in Germany were, were surprised uh, to you know to, to to hear about your uh, perspective, uh, but this is uh, something that's extremely uh, necessary, needed, uh, um, you know, in this uh, day and age when uh, when Russia, uh, as the uh, successor of the Soviet Union, in so many negative ways, let's put it this way, is again once again threatening the uh, pillars of uh, not only of European security but the international order. So Stephanie, please lead us. You know, tell us about your book. Tell us about your, your findings. Uh, and what are the lessons for Ukraine, for, for NATO, and for the world as a whole? Yeah, thank you so much, Mark, uh, for this wonderful introduction. I almost feel a bit flattered when you listed all my achievements. But before I come to that, let me uh, simply say a very warm welcome to all of you who have um, connected to this uh, lecture. I can't really see you, but uh, I hope uh, you can see me and hear me clearly. Um, I'm sitting here in the northern part of Germany, um, and it's really a privilege uh, for me to spend the next hour and so with you. Um, so thank you very, very much, the American University in Kiev, and in particular, a warm, very um, big thank you to you, Mark, uh, for having reached out, for having invited me. It's, it's really a pleasure. I would like to also applaud uh, applaud you, applaud all the Ukrainian students and the faculty members for pursuing the path of education during these very extraordinary difficult times. I think that's not a given. I mean, to really stick to your profession, to stick here to your objectives, to, uh, to go to school, to attend university lectures in, in these times. Um, so I think this is absolutely wonderful. And I would really, really like to applaud everyone uh, who is sitting in and outside the American University Kiev for, for doing that. I think that's fabulous. But I would also like, before I come to my lecture, to pay tribute. And I don't do this in order to be simply nice or to be polite or to flatter you, but I would like to pay tribute to all of you, to all Ukrainians, and um, in particular to those uh, who are fighting uh, on different fronts to uh, defend your country. Uh, I would like to particularly applaud your absolutely amazing degree of resilience and of bravery. I'm only an observer. Um, I'm a bystander, but I've been following Ukraine's path of Euro-Atlantic integration I'd say probably for the past 20 or so years. Um, I've been quite often to your country. I've uh, been in and out and I've been in my former jobs uh, at NATO, even responsible for NATO's information and documentation center in Kiev. Uh, um, I have uh, worked very closely with Ukrainian diplomats and Ukrainian NGOs over the path of the past 20 or so years trying to bring Ukrainian closer to NATO. Um, and ever since um, the full-fledged war broke out and ever since Russia did what it did in this unprecedented terrorizing way to you, and I'd say to all of us, um, your country um, preoccupies my mind. I'd say really, and I don't exaggerate this, um, on a daily basis, day and night. I have really started to devote a lot of energy to support you. I'm not alone in this. My husband Holger is uh, is with me and a number of friends, uh, but I'm really doing my best in order to use what I have. I mean, use the venues, the platforms that I have in order to further your case. Um, I don't have missiles. I don't have Taurus missiles. I don't have drones, but I do have my voice, I do have my brain, and I do have a, I'd say, considerable international network. And this is actually what I use in order to 
support your case. Um, so I just wanted to say this and um, um, because it really means something to me. Uh, and it also ultimately uh, brings me to what Mark already mentioned, namely to writing a book. I mean, I uh, didn't really leave NATO uh, in order to sit down and write a book. It was not my intention. But again, on the 24th of February last year, uh, when also the German media and other international media started to come over me and ask for my opinion and my analysis, I was approached uh, by a publishing house and they said, wouldn't you like to actually write down what you think? Because, uh, yes, um, having been at NATO for so long, I've been inside the machine room of NATO working very closely with um, all the issues that we are currently dealing with, from seeing the NATO-Russia partnership growing to seeing also the partnership with Ukraine growing. So, yeah, I put on a piece of paper on various pages, to be more precise, what I think. Um, and I would like to use um, the um, remaining time of my short lecture to share with you three particular points that I hope they will be of interest to you. Um, and we can uh, discuss that in detail more later. The first is a rather general, but I think very important observation. Um, I'm, I maintain the argument that you can possibly develop a way forward out of this drama, out of this war, out of this fundamental conflict in which we are in, without taking some time to reflect upon the past, to at least give some space to some form of self-critical reflection. And when I'm saying we, I'm talking primarily decision makers. I have only partially been in a position of a decision maker. I just supported what heads of state of government and ministers over the past 20 and so years did. But I think it's important that in our countries, in the countries of Ukraine supporters, but also in Ukraine itself, we take some time to reflect where we actually completely mis misjudged and miscalculated our course of action. And I spent some time, not only in my book, but more broadly, going around in my country and elsewhere to encourage decision makers to have the courage um, to, to, to self-critically and honestly, really, and frankly, reflect what we did wrong and where we actually had what I call blind spots in our eyes, where we saw something, but we didn't really react. And when I look at Russia um, in the past 20 and so years, I think we all saw what we could have seen, namely that Russia over a certain period of time, lately starting in 27, a long time ago, started to turn both domestically, but also from its foreign policy posture into an authoritarian and aggressive, more expansionist country. This didn't happen overnight and it didn't really felt all the way through the partnership that NATO established with Russia. I myself uh, chaired a number of so-called NATO Russia Council task forces, working groups and committees. I was responsible for a number of projects um, on which we agreed with the Russian side. So I know firsthand how it felt at the beginning, and it felt like there was a readiness in Russia to really engage with the Euro-Atlantic broader family, to really play along, to really stick to the rules of the game, to really be part of a broader uh, family of nations. But it changed. And as I said, latest in 2007, with Georgia, uh, with um, um, Russia's uh, military aggression and intervention in Georgia, it changed. And that was the first time I thought, um, looking back at those years, where we should have stopped, where we should have taken a pause and where our leaders, our decision makers should have reacted differently. But they didn't. I mean, yes, I mean, they criticized Russia. They blamed Russia for what it did in Georgia. Uh, but then they turned around and offered a so-called reset policy. And the reset policy, which was back then framed by the government of or the administration of Barack Obama, was basically aimed at 
Yes, resetting relations, trying to find common ground on broader strategic issues with Russia and really put aside those critical um, and yeah, uneasy themes um, and sentiments that we all had in us. I recall vividly 2008 when we then made the second big mistake, which was at the Bucharest summit that NATO hosted. And uh, you all aware, I mean, that NATO's, um, I know one of the big NATO decisions uh, which was on the table was uh, the application of both Georgia and Ukraine to apply for membership action plan. I was in the room with the other leaders, uh, including in the NATO Russia Council, and I heard the German chancellor back then and the former French uh, president Sarkozy vividly um, and vehemently arguing against. Um, I thought that was this, I mean, the second big, big mistake that we made because we left Ukraine in a security gray zone. We said, yes, at some point, I mean, you'll be, you become member, but we don't say when, and we don't say how, and we don't give you a concrete timetable. We just continue basically remaining on autopilot. That was, again, I keep on stressing this, a second big blind spot that we had in our eyes. And clearly it led us to consequential Russian aggressive behavior that we saw in Syria, that we saw in our own countries, with the rise of hybrid attacks against um, member states, against uh, cyber um, infrastructure in member states of NATO. We saw disinformation campaigns. So there was a lot, lot of um, what I would call indicators that should have led to decision makers to say, listen, there is something wrong with our relationship. We need to alter the course of action. And then 2014 came and I was in the room uh, with um, ambassadors in the North Atlantic Council when they were shown the first footage, live footage of the so-called little green man conquering Crimea. And um, what was followed back then was, I think, another third big strategic mistake. Yes, NATO decided to upgrade its defense and deterrence posture, but basically it remained behind its own fences. Yeah? It remained behind uh, its own fence, um, parting the, the NATO territory from the so-called countries in between. I mean, the very, very term countries in between gives you an indication. <laughs> I mean, what a bizarre security concept that was. Yes, geographically, Ukraine, Moldova, also ultimately Belarus is, uh, are not members of NATO and they are between us and Russia. But I mean, security wise, to label them as countries in between and not really um, help them to guard against this growing, very visible Russian aggression now was another major mistake. So I'm listing these mistakes because I think it's important that we do have a discussion about these mistakes. And I, as I said, I keep on going around from forum to forum and arguing that, yeah, that's an important part of a strategy process too, to reflect what we did wrong. But I must be honest with you, between Oslo and Rome, between Berlin and Washington, I don't see much appetite for having these type of reflection. Um, I also said at the beginning, I would like to encourage also Ukrainians to also have the same type of self-critical reflections, because during these, let's say, stormy times when Ukraine, or rather before Ukraine, ultimately decided to really move westward and uh, aspire membership both in the European Union and NATO, I mean, there were also quite a bit of domestic ups and downs. I mean, there were people, groups, parties who very openly favored a close relationship with Russia. So I'm not saying this is to blame people, but this is this is about to reflect about something. And that's my first point. My second point relates to what Mark already alluded to, um, which brings me to the very critical question, which is really on everybody's mind, I suppose, and in particular on your mind, how do we get out of here? 
How do we move forward? What's the way forward? And sometimes it's um, useful to uh, reconsider lessons from other historical areas and the lessons learned that eventually can be applied from the very early days of the Cold War leads us to the gentleman called George Cannon. I mean, if you Google George Cannon, yeah, uh, if you read his books or if you just Google him, um, you will land at what Mark already said, namely that he was right after the end of the uh, Second World War, a US senior diplomat stationed at the uh, US embassy in Moscow. And uh, he knew Russia well, he knew the former Soviet Union well, and observing what was going on between the end in 45 of the Second World War and the consequential following two years, he ultimately thought he should try to send, let's say, a wake-up call to his masters in Washington. And so he sent this long telegram, a long telegram which you can today read, and it's interesting because what he describes about the nature of the back then Soviet system, of the Soviet rulers, of their worldview, of the way they operated, about their aspirations, I think there is really quite a bit that uh, makes us think about how the Kremlin operates today. Now, there are quite a number of parallels. The Soviet Union, yes, I mean, it had its own ideology, but it also had really as underpinning momentum a very antagonistic worldview. The same applies to the Kremlin today. It's they and us. It's rather, you know, it's either they or, or us. Yeah. And so George Cannon proposed a number of things, how the West, in particular, how Washington should possibly and could possibly respond. And if you boil it down to the most important deliverables, as we would say today, he basically said, listen, we are in this for the long time. The Soviet Union, the Soviet, let's say, expansionist aspiration, the way, I mean, they will try to pursue their national objectives, not only in Europe, but across the globe, in our own countries, including, will be there for a long time. It will not go away. So we better develop this strategic resolve and patience in order to be in this for a long time. We need to have a long-term plan. And I think that's something which I would today say is, I mean, if I apply this to the situation today, is what we need um, to do or acknowledge rather as well. We need to be prepared to think about this systemic confrontation in which we are in with the Kremlin right now for the longer term. Which brings me to my second takeaway from George Cannon. Um, he suggested that the democratic world, the liberal world, should look at the instruments, the means and tools that they have at their disposal in order to really push back, contain Russia's scope of action, of maneuvering to the extent possible not only abroad, not only by pushing back Russian malign influences abroad, but, but also in our own countries. It's amazing. I mean, the guy lived uh, and, and worked at the end of the 40s, and he spoke about disinformation campaigns that we are struggling with today. I mean, some 80 years later. So yes, without playing the same rules or playing the same games, we need to really combine and synchronize our own means, our own tools in order to push back uh, Russia to the extent possible. And the third takeaway, very briefly, um, is also something which applies for today's situation, that we need to do this from, from, from a position of strength, yeah? Not try to give in uh, to the temptation, if I can call it like that, the temptation to, to, to hope at some point we can manage relations with Russia. You cannot manage a relationship with a great nuclear and conventionally armed power, which is on an assertive aggressionist path. 
it's nuisance. I mean, to hope you just need to find the right mix of incentives, economic incentives, diplomatic incentives, and then you can basically manage that relationship. You need to be very clear um, in your own strategic objectives, which is, as I already said, to push back to the extent possible and communicate to the Russian side that they shouldn't even try <laughs> to doubt our own resolve, for which we obviously need unity within our own ranks. Now, all this is probably, I wouldn't say, pretty logical. I mean, who would argue against uh, containment now, in particular in a retro perspective, knowing that we were able to live and prosper economically, socially, and politically under the umbrella of containment for more than, what, 50, 60 years? For a long time, Europe lived under that containment, um, and it benefited from this type of containment. It didn't come without any costs, because if you look at what the Allies back then um, invested into into military capabilities and defense budgets, it was considerable. It was really, really considerable. If you compare it with today's budgets, it's, I mean, it was almost, you know, triple as much. So I'm making this point about George Kennan, not because I think one could apply his containment policy one by one. This is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's probably worthwhile looking at what he actually prescribed to us and trying to adjust, adapt some of his thoughts for today's situation. Now, which leads me to my third and final point, and then I'll stop. But if you'd look at the discussion in in NATO member countries, in Ukraine's supporting countries today, after 20 months of this absolutely unprecedented wave of terror that you all must endure, you have still countries, and I regret to say I would also include my own country, Germany, um, not, it's not the only one, but I think it's a very illustrative example, who argues basically you can't, this is number one, you can't and shouldn't mess around with a nuclear power. <laughs> you, you shouldn't do that, yeah? So we'll hope, um, even though we support Ukraine financially, economically, and also to a certain extent militarily, we hope that at some point Russia, Russia's military aggression will come to a halt and we find ourselves in some form at the negotiation table. And then... We will again go back to the idea of managing that relationship. <laughs> I and you, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I guess you wouldn't be surprised if I say that I'm completely of the opposite opinion. I think it would be a major strategic mistake if we would go along that path. Um, I would also argue that we would need to, in applying a new containment strategy, um, need to put a number of priorities on top. And the number one priority that I would put in this containment strategy on top is to, first of all, and unconditionally, give Ukrainians all military equipment that they need, without any caveats, without any restrictions. Um, Unfortunately, again, this is not completely the case. There is a delta between what countries pledge and what actually arrives. And there is still, in some countries, um, the thought that we must not give Ukrainians, for instance, long-range uh, missiles or artillery uh, because they can eventually really, really manage to conquer or back con or to reconquer Crimea. Yeah. So you have these people in, in capitals, and I'm afraid to say um, there is obviously quite a bit of um, persuasion needed in order to make our points heard. But I would put, if I were asked, I would put on top of my list um, a full-fledged, long, long, longer-termed uh, military equipment for Ukraine. The number two I would put on my list, and I think this is 
I mean, this goes very much without saying. In looking into the future, we must not allow ourselves to create any longer gray zones. Now, if we are really serious about creating Europe whole and free, of course, we must strive to integrate both Ukraine, but I would also argue the other countries, uh, if they wanted, Moldova, for instance, or parts of the Western Balkans, where Russia's influence is still pretty toxic, we must involve them and integrate them and give them a an integration perspective, which is not 20 years, but rather two years. And this clearly also applies for NATO membership. Yeah, I have been advocating uh, in summer, day out and day in, um, to give Ukraine a very concrete timetable for accession talks. Yeah. For me, it's absolutely clear. I mean, we cannot and must not, even at, at some point, military activities will will come to a halt and will cease. You know, we, we must really um, bring Ukraine into uh, the NATO family in order to give it the protection, the defense protection it needs, and it fully deserves. So one of the big things that I think we need to collectively do and work on is to persuade policymakers and those countries who are still reluctant to do so. But the longer we wait, the longer we send a strategic message to Mr. Putin that he can basically just continue doing what he does. And uh, trying to change the strategic dynamic, not just on the battlefield, but broader, um, broader in a broader political and strategic sense, we need to give him messages, we need to send him messages that he clearly understands where we draw red lines. And the red lines that I would draw is clearly um, um, is, is clearly, um, you know, in, in the membership, uh, in the NATO membership business, he would not dare to do so. So <clears throat> um, the final um, element I would like to mention, and then I'll really stop here, uh, I would put in my baskets of containment um, is to look at the entire set of economic sanctions and technological sanctions, which is not really a NATO business, yes, but it's a, an EU business in the first place. We have put these sanctions into place. Um, they sound sounded pretty good at the beginning, but now after some 20 plus months, we have all come to see that they're holes, big holes, <laughs> that, they're, that we basically underuse our own sanctions. There are companies uh, located in my countries and other countries who don't give, excuse my language, a damn about the sanctions. So we need to tighten the screw. If you really would like to impose economic pain on Russia, we need to strengthen the regime, the sanctioned regime. I think this is very, very important. I will not go through the entire list because I would like to um, keep something for our discussion, but I hope I haven't spoken for too long. But uh, yeah, as a last word, you find in me um, a German and a very, very staunch supporter of Ukraine. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions. Stephanie, thank you for uh, being uh, so outspoken. Uh, thank you for your candid, uh, um, you know, uh, discussion, of course, uh, you know, thank you for everything that you've done, um, first and foremost, for Ukraine uh, in the uh, in the past couple of years. And, and before that, of course, since the aggression, the original Russian aggression began, and of course, for um, highlighting so many important issues, um, unfortunately, that many uh, European uh, and NATO leaders have not been uh, thinking about um i i already have uh, several really fantastic questions uh, many of them deal with the interplay between the military military power and political means uh, but let me um use my my prerogative as a, as a moderator to ask you a couple of questions of my own um you know this this talk is obviously part of uh, part and parcel of um our graduate level course on the global security system and, and so i would really like our students to understand um, a little bit of the of the theory uh, that, that kind of underpins your thinking, 
and mm -hmm. how we can actually use some of that and also the the historical reference to Kennan and what he did uh, to actually uh, elaborate and create a, a viable policy for the next uh, 50 years. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, Kennan, as we as we mentioned, you know, wrote what he what he you know the, the long telegram in forty six. It was published in forty seven uh, by Foreign Affairs uh, under the um, uh, um, uh, you know uh, um, Mr X you know mm. Um, mm, right. name, and then it became the you know really the 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 the, the pres prescription, so to speak, for the next forty plus years until. Uh, until 1989 and the, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, do you see, uh, the, the as I've been thinking for all the years, and then as you mm -hmm. were talking, uh, why Cannon was so successful in convincing the first the American leadership at the time, obviously Truman, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then obviously the Western leaders, uh, the, the fact that he proposed uh, really workable solutions, first and foremost, uh, psychological warfare, and then uh, economic aid to the uh, nations of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, this, you know, he put, really put the focus on the non-military aspects mm -hmm. of containment. Correct. Yeah. Uh, until really uh, Reagan came in the in the 1980s with his rollback strategy, mm -hmm. where he actively started, uh, uh, you know, toppling or, or supporting, you know, mm -hmm. the the collapse of uh, leftist, uh, you know, pro-communist, pro-Soviet governments, especially in in Latin America, but also across the global south. Um, so do you see any appetite uh, currently um, among, you know, the elites that you've been dealing with uh, in, in Germany, Western Europe, uh, to actually repeat this long term uh, strategy? It's not a strategy for the next one or two years. We're talking mm -hmm. about decades in the future. Mm -hmm. What are, uh, you know, do you see any anyone ready to uh, uh, undertake this uh, gigantic, ginormous task? And what will be some of the challenges to execute a coherent strategy, not, as I said, for the next three, four, mm -hmm. five years, mm -hmm. but for four or five decades? Well, um, you've probably read a few uh, of the articles that I've read as well, also by, for instance, Condoleezza Rice uh, or Neil Ferguson. Uh, they are argued not necessarily related to um to um to russia but also looking at china we haven't even spoken about china uh one of uh, russia's partners in crime if i can call it like that but uh yes these these uh people um i think uh they are they are very much along the same line of of thoughts here um i am also aware that the former deputy uh, NATO Secretary General Alexander Wershberg, another mm -hmm. top American official and a big uh, uh, Russia, um, so to speak, expert, um, he has already a year and a half ago published an article about NATO, uh, inviting NATO to reconsider containment. So yes, there are a few voices. I haven't heard too many, I must admit, and this probably can be explained by the fact that the bulk of people and capitals, at least to what I can, to the extent I can observe, they are still in this crisis management mood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are still Absolutely. occupied by trying to grasp um, the bulk of um, coordin I mean, coordination work, which is needed, whether it's on the economic aid side or the financial aid side or the military aid side. Yeah, this is quite a bit of work and it requires a lot of effort and time. I understand that. But I all, I find this very short-sighted. Yeah, I mean, of course, we can do the planning from one Rammstein meeting to the next, from one NATO ministerial meeting to the next. From, But this is not a substitute for taking a step back and thinking. Uh, how do we really want to approach? Well, in my private conversations with a couple of leaders, I particularly would like to point out the Czech president, Peter Pavel, um, or um, colleagues I know in, Esto in Estonia or in, in, in Finland. I mean, they very much would, just having listened to what I just said, says, yeah, I agree. I, I think we are in this for the long time. We need to have a strategy. We need to go beyond the day-to-day -day business. We must not fail because if we fail, I mean, we have a gigantic problem in Europe as a whole. Um, even, even, I mean, really uh, super gigantic. So yeah, there is this sense, but there is also, yeah, there is also, there are also other people. And I, 
at least in my advocacy work, I try to focus on the other people in order to really massage them and push them and push them and push them. Um, but we are far from having only had one dedicated discussion in NATO on the level of NATO ambassadors about what George Kennan could possibly tell us today. Yeah, uh, What I'm saying here, I should probably not say in public, but th there is no such a conceptual, doctrinal, broader strategic debate to this very stage. So we must try to put it on the agenda. I think that's that would be very important. Uh, that's extremely important, and I'm very, very happy that, that as I said, you candidly uh, share this with us. Could it be uh, this lack of uh, of an overall grand strategy? That's effectively what mm -hmm. it's tantamount to. Uh, uh, this lack of courage to uh, admit to ourselves that we're in this fight for the long time, even even after Ukraine defeats uh, Russia and expels it, which I'm mm -hmm. sure it will, with mm -hmm. uh, with the right aid. But you know that doesn't mean the end of uh, Putin's no. regime. And even no. the end of Putin, uh, Putin himself doesn't mean the end of autocracy in Russia, right? Absolutely. And, and so, uh, so you know, having having said that, um, what, what do you think uh, Cannon would say, like if he had the chance to take to to look at the situation these days? I mean, obviously he's he mm -hmm. passed away back in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cannon was obviously a, a, a great uh, op opponent, an enemy of of, of the Soviet regime. But in other ways, he was also a Rus Russophile in the classical sense. You know, this you know, he spoke the Russian language. He studied it in Riga, Latvia, between the two wars. Mm -hmm. um, then, after the Soviet Union collapsed, he was very critical of the expansion of NATO. You you would agree. But if he would see now the Russian nation that so appears so united in in their hatred against the West. I mean, back in the day, he he described a Russian well, a Soviet nation that's subjugated by its own rulers. So he clearly made the distinction that the Soviet leadership is one thing, the Soviet people are mm. something else. Mm. Now it seems that they're the Russians, you know, the huge percentage are actually quite, uh, you know, anti anti Western. Do we have a chance to even, you know, influence their hearts and mind? Well, we can contain them, right? And I hope we do. How do we go further? How do we go beyond? How do we pass through this wall of propaganda, lies, uh, uh, state control? That that Putin has designed for for and his his regime has designed for Russia. Well, this is a full set of, of different questions. But coming to your first, what Cannon eventually would say, I I think he would probably be both appalled and shocked at the same time if we tell him that Russia set out to destroy a nation, the Soviet Union back then. Yes, it tried to exert its uh, military and political dominance uh, within the Warsaw Pact countries. Yes, and it, it, I mean, it sent out, let's say, on a here, I mean, on, on a number of occasions, um, tanks and troops in order to suppress opposition and political dissent, as we've seen in Hungary and in Czechoslovakia back then. So, but these were small almost, you know, limited military excursion. They, they served a certain purpose. But what Russia has started to do in um, back in 2014 and now has exemplified uh, this on the military, in the military sense, is to basically try to annihilate a nation, yeah, destroy a nation. Um, and I would say, I would I would assume, I don't know, but I would assume uh, that Kagan would be pretty shocked about this level of aggression. I mean, it's a different quality. I mean, it's a different quality to go into Syria and to support somebody like Assad and you go with certain, let's say, limited military objectives and limited military power, or you amass you know, uh, half of your army in order to destroy your neighbor and terrorize your neighbor and commit ecocide and, and commit war crimes of, of in that size. I mean, this is really a full, fully, I mean, completely different dimension. But I would also probably assume that Kennan would say, you know, what, what this regime in Moscow fears and hates most is 
you know, is economic success, is civil liberties, is people <laughs> who are actually content with their life and would like to stay in their countries, would like to develop a life, a democratic, liberal, full and rich life. Um, so that's why I think it's so important uh, to not only provide Ukraine with military aid, but also with a very stable economic and financial backing uh, and the prospect of, you know, of nurturing every skills that you have, every opportunity, business and economic opportunities in the educational realm to really, you know, also show to the Russian people that despite military attacks, drone attacks and rockets and missiles, yeah, um, Ukraine wants to remain a prosperous, economic, stable country. And so pumping money, to put it very plastically, I mean, pumping money into Ukraine is a good investment, I think, in order to also resist and defend against uh, Russia's aggression. But coming to the question of the Russian people, well, I mean, we are talking millions and millions and millions of people. Um, I've spent probably like you and many others, a good portion of my life also traveling through Russia. And I, yeah, I, I would probably boil it down to the following. You know, every one of us has to make choices. <laughs> yeah, the Russian people, despite having lived and still living under these circumstances, they can also make their choices. Well, for instance, sending their kids to London schools or on French holidays or to whatever. So there, there is and was a middle class growing under Putin's uh, reign um, that had a good let's say um they had opportunities to test how the western how western life is yeah they took advantage of that and to a certain extent they still take advantage of that if ultimately their decision is to stick with the system then that's their choice yeah um but uh i'm not advocating regime change but i'm advocating fighting the regime yeah and everyone who wants to join can do that yeah uh during the soviet union uh dissidents um had a hard time and many of them ended up in labor camps but they took their choice they make their choice yeah um in order to resist uh, a a very authoritarian uh, regime so yes i'm disappointed about as you can probably hear in my voice about uh, the broader Russian public's reaction. And I was particularly disappointed when I saw young, talented, um, multilingual, well-educated uh, young Russians getting in their cars and in their bikes on the 20 or before the 21st of September last year and simply pissing off. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> going away. Yeah. Ending up in Istanbul and Vilnius, and so because they didn't want to um, uh, to to uh, become drafted, I, I can understand that. But that's also a choice. But I don't have in particular sympathies for that type of choice. Okay, again, thank you for <laughs> for candidly sharing that. Sorry. Now, <laughs> excuse my language. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are absolutely no need to excuse it, and everybody is thrilled. Actually, before I uh, open the floor, well, actually, I will be asking the questions. But we have many, many questions now. One of our students uh, uh, actually wrote that Dr. Bobs should be the next Chancellor of Germany. <laughs> Thank you. That tells you how you know how popular you have now become in 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 those uh, uh, thirty or so minutes. Um, of your into your lecture now we have about um, about half an hour or so for questions i'm gonna yeah. be asking them in the order in which they were mm -hmm. sent to me uh some of them i'll try to combine because you know they, mm -hmm. they cover different aspects uh, so i have a, a couple of interesting questions on the um the logic of force that nato had forsaken after the uh, the end of the cold war um you know canon as you as you wrote uh, clearly understood that the russian leadership um uh, is influenced mostly by the uh, well the soviet leadership at the time but the current russian leadership too 
you know the the logic of force the threat of force you know if you push against them they mm -hmm. they yield okay so the, the question is um um uh, why did nato you know 30 years ago kind of retreated from this logic and and, and decided to trust uh russia to trust that the that, that, um, the russian uh, system would become democratic uh, and linked to that uh is the second question do you think it's practically possible uh for uh for a strong nato response meaning a limited or indirect nato military involvement especially the the fact that nato has superior technology weapon systems mm -hmm. and then ukraine has this uh unique experience in fighting against uh, russia's military machine so the uh, uh forego you know forsaking of the logic of force 30 years ago it was a mistake why it happened what can be done is nato in your opinion mm -hmm. ready to actually use uh, return to the politics of, of, of forces. Well, to be fair to my former employer, <laughs> mm. um, the principle of deterrence, both conventional and nuclear, um, is still very, very important for all member countries. And that's why um, they have, even though they were engaged in other operations like in Afghanistan, one must not forget that uh, over the past 20 years, um, they have come to reconsider the importance of collective defense and deterrence. And so ever since 2014, you see that not all, but a number of countries have really started to reinvest into the credibility of their deterrence posture, which is to invest more into their own defenses, uh, budgets, uh, research and development, and ultimately also boots on the ground. Um, this is very much true for some countries, as I said, but it's not unfortunately true for all countries. And that's a struggle that my former bosses, the NATO secretary generals, have ever embarked on, namely to remind countries there is uh, really an obligation to maintain that particular level of, credi uh, of credibility and deterrence. This is, I wouldn't say theory, but this is probably what a formal official uh, of NATO would uh, would say today. But the other part of the story is also that, looking in particular at the relationship with Russia, that a number of countries, many countries, not all, but a number of countries, France, Turkey, Hungary, uh, Spain, Italy, the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, and Washington, over many, many years thought and I repeat what I already said before, they could manage the relationship with Putin. Yeah, we simply need to find the right instruments. We simply need to find the right messages. We simply needed to find the right projects. So as long as we could accommodate some of Russia's interest, Russia would basically accept NATO's broader policies, including the policy of enlargement. And... I think they really believe what they put on piece of papers and endless communiques. <laughs> they really believed it, yeah. And they, they over time, um, they they were simply not really prepared to acknowledge that Russia left that partnership already some you know some years ago. I mean, long before twenty fourteen, it left the partnership politically, mentally, and emotionally. Yeah. Um, and we simply didn't react. Now, um, would NATO be prepared to get involved in the current state of affairs? No. NATO took, right at the beginning of the war, a very principled decision, which is to say, we support Ukraine, but no boots on the ground. We don't want to become a, a party to the war. Um, I was among those who also signed a letter um, in the early days of the war in February to at least invite NATO to consider the introduction of a no-fly zone. There were a handful of us, I mean, not massive, but a handful of, of officials, former officials and think tankers. It wasn't even discussed once at the NATO headquarters. And the reason was very simple because President Biden had decided it was a no-go. And he still maintains that argument 
until this very day. So as long as you have an administration in Washington who says, yes, we'll prevail, but I don't want to get directly involved in a military confrontation with Russia, or at least risk to get involved. Um, you, you, you are basically exposing Ukraine to that Russian aggression. That's the the net result. I mean that you all experience, unfortunately, on an everyday basis. But you also put yourself, if you look at it from an abstract way, in a strategic dilemma. Yeah, because. You can't influence the course of events on the battlefield, not directly. Yeah, um, you you basically just push the Ukrainians to the fore, um, and you make them really dependent on um, on your own aid. But you can't you can't really define or rather shape or influence the end state of this. Which and, is uh, yeah, the end state. Yeah, the end state. So this is what NATO is struggling with all the time. I mean, how to bridge that, yeah, how to how to overcome, how to reconcile that dilemma. Yes, we are with you and support you, but no, we don't want to get involved. Not really. And so whether it was the um, destruction of the Kakovka Dam in summer, whether it was whether it was really awful atrocities and war crimes committed in Irpin, Butcher and elsewhere, whether it was the destruction of entire cities. Uh, for me personally, I mean, one of the most dreadful experience was to see the destruction of Mariupol. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really looking for words almost, yeah? I mean, we all saw it on TV, yeah, basically, what happened in front of our own eyes, what happened to the people in, in Mariupol and surrounding areas. And in German talk shows, French talk shows and American talk shows, they debated the difference between offensive and defensive weapon systems for weeks. And weeks. And our chancellor said, no, no, no. I mean, we can't possibly give them Leos. We can't possibly give them Leopard tanks. And uh, we can't possibly give them this and that. I mean, that could basically provoke Russia. So you see, I'm getting almost emotional when I reconsider this, but there were opportunities for NATO to put at least a marker yeah, to say, <laughs> listen, yeah, at least on the on the on the strategic messaging side. But they decided not to. And so my expectation is this policy will remain in place as long as the uh, principles remain in power, which is, you know, uh, in particular, President Biden, but also Chancellor Scholz and a couple of other colleagues. My personal hope is, and on that then I will probably stop that there will be, you know, a coalition of the willing within NATO, a group of countries who are more prepared to think about how they could help um, Ukraine, not only with weapon uh, deliveries, but also beyond the day, beyond the, the day where the, um, the, the fighting will come to a halt. And this brings us to the question about a NATO a Western presence, a military presence on Ukrainian ground, on territory. Yeah. Um, as long as Ukraine is not a full-fledged member of NATO, there must be some type of visible presence. Now, how could this look like? Who could this be? How could this be organized? Yeah. Who would be prepared to put in troops, boots on the ground? That's a discussion that I have already started to have with some capitals with some colleagues in capitals, to be more precise. But on the open, on the official level, people get a heart attack if you put the question to that. That's yeah. a bitter reality. Um, but I think we need to, we, I put myself here into our, let's say, collective shoes, but I think we need to reconsider that and really also through the Ukrainian government, really push back to the extent possible. And for that, we need all voices, every voice. Absolutely, especially voices like you and voices uh, such as the uh, those of uh, all those brave Ukrainians, uh, 
not only you know obviously they're they're the people who are fighting but also they're experts they're a think tank community they're academic uh, people politicians actually uh, this is one of the questions from um uh, from one of our um, brilliant students, who's actually a professor in Germany, ah. she teaches at the at the Hochschule für Okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. so she's asking about, uh, uh, you know, about what uh, you know. Th there are so many uh, Ukrainian opinion leaders. Um, you know, if if there were so many blind spots, why not? You know, why not use more Ukrainian voices that would explain mm -hmm. to the to the Western audience, to the Western decision mm -hmm. makers. Mm -hmm. um you know what what you know what what's really happening mm -hmm. do you see do you see um do you see this possible do you see yeah yeah especially, definitely. In, the, especially in the context of, of russian propaganda being so powerful in the west mm -hmm. why not bring more uh in, in, as a matter of official policy more mm -hmm. uh, of uh, ukrainian voices to the west well i have to first of all say i give immense credit to whoever is in charge of uh, designing and implementing your informations operations campaign mm. <laughs> I think ukrainians do a fabulous job uh, in making their voices heard in particular also in the social media if i look at my twitter or rather x uh stream or linkedin or in the social media platforms i see a lot of ukrainians uh with very smart um stories messages background information varying i mean the various messaging i think that's very very important um so that it doesn't really boil down to we just need guns yeah so there is a, a whole array of messages that you can uh, play with and and craft in order to get the story across and i'm talking now almost as a public relations official but i was responsible for crafting NATO's public diplomacy strategies for so many years. So this is still a bit in the back of my mind. But more than messages on social media, people matter. People to people relations. Yeah. People telling their stories, people um engaging in different in different groups, uh, whether it's you know, student to student exchange, whether it's uh, um Ukrainian artists, uh, lawmakers, and so I think you have a number of really super, super talented and impressive, let's say, um, ambassadors, yeah? I mean, uh, talking ambassadors, talking hats. I, I met, I had the pleasure to meet, for instance, Alexandra Matvichuk uh, some time ago, and I know she is doing a lot. She goes around from form to form. But there are plenty, plenty more opportunities. And let me also stress finally the importance um, to talk business to business. Yeah? Um, and let me make a parenthesis here. I mean, when I was given this award of uh, the top 100 people that are women in Germany, I um, gave a masterclass um, to uh, a group of very, very prominent and successful female entrepreneurs in Germany. And I suggested to them, I mean, to establish something like a sisterhood program for Ukrainian <laughs> female entrepreneurs, yeah? Um, get them involved, um, offer them tutorships, invite them to their activities, whether it's not in situ, do it online. I mean, but but really find partnerships steady partnerships which is not just you know you meet a person and then you he or she disappears yeah so do this so ukrainians can go out and offer that but i think there is also plenty of opportunities if i look at german companies if i look at associations etc but people to people contacts matter more than anything else you can design a wonderful campaign <laughs> with headlines and illustrious uh, footage. But it's people you must ultimately persuade. And this crowd that you're talking to is definitely, uh, uh, you know, yeah. needs no persuading. And no, no. Many, many of <laughs> them, good. especially those who work in the West mm -hmm. and have Western contacts, yeah. are spreading the word. Uh, but again, yeah. thank you for proposing such a bold plan. Let's move back uh, in, the, in the last 10 or 15 minutes that we have. Uh, to NATO, 
you know, there, there's a good, uh, um, you know, succinct question on how does NATO see the end of this war? You said about, you spoke about, um, you know, the end, the strategic end. Mm -hmm. What's the end of the war? Is it the, is it just, uh, what is a satisfactory result? Is it just Ukraine recovering its territory or is it uh, the end of Putin's regime? You know, what should Ukraine also, from, from the point of view of NATO and from the point of view of Ukraine, what do you think should be the strategic end game? Well, in order to um, understand NATO's positioning, which is the collective positioning of some 31 countries, hopefully one very soon, we just have a few references. One is, uh, for instance, the summit docu uh, communique, mm -hmm. where, where, where the countries actually put in writing um, what they think, uh, what how they view that. And if you'd look at the Vilnius summit communique, mm -hmm you find a lot of negotiated diplomatic language. I nevertheless advise you, if you haven't done so already, to take a really dull moment <laughs> mm -hmm. and go through the communique in order to try to understand what is really said in the text and also between the lines. And you will, you will not be able to find a lot of concrete answers to the questions you just posed to me because... NATO still maintains the sentence or the language rather, we will remain with Ukraine as long as it takes, full stop. There is no prescribed, defined strategic end state. And NATO has been able to agree on this rather loose and a bit vague formula because of the fact that individual member countries have different stakes, have different views, have different interests in this. I don't want to single out too many individual allies, but as I've already singled out my own country a few times, let me just, you know, illustrate this with the uh, Turkish or the, the, the Hungarian position. If we were to go to Hungary, or if we were to go to um, meet uh, President Erdogan, and we'd ask him, what is your end state, your desired end state? He would probably say, we want to have uh, peace. Yes, we want to see an end of uh, military activities. We also would like to see Ukraine taking back its full territories. Yeah, but he would certainly not agree with my argument saying we need to contain Russia because it's a malign, toxic actor in Europe. Yeah, that we need to uh, strategically defeat. So you have different views uh, around the table, and that's why it's so difficult to come up with something really, really precise. Um, and there is not even, I think that's what your president, President Zelensky and his uh, colleagues are trying so hard to do, to, to find or rather generate consensus behind his 10 point peace plan. I mean, these are re relatively generic 10 points. And somebody with a normal mind would pr probably say, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they all make sense. I mean, there should be the guiding principles of a peace plan. And yet, I haven't really seen full fledged support by NATO for his peace plan, not officially. I have seen individual country support for the peace plan. But there are still People in some capitals would say, this is all elusive. We will never be able to bring Russia to justice. We'll never be able to bring Putin in front of a special tribunal or court. So why should we actually put this as a desired end state? Yeah. Um, and you have countries, again, I, I apologize for repeating myself again, but who are really, really cautious because they still fear that uh, that Putin, Putinism, the Putin system would eventually collapse, the Russian Federation disintegrates, and then they argue the, the problem would be much bigger because you would then have a, an actor in Europe that you can't control. And my argument against that is, I mean, who controls Russia? I mean, this is useless, I mean, to make that point. We will not be able to really influence the course of Russia's domestic action. We will not. So whatever will, will turn out, however Russia will look like in 20 years, we don't know. 
but we should really focus on our own security and to make those countries part of a stable and peaceful democratic family um, who want to be part of that. And Ukraine is very much on top of that. Sadly, you are you are you are absolutely right, and and the, the um, policy that you are describing is based on the uh, on the principle of the devil we know. Putin yeah. is the devil that they know, yeah. and right. unfortunately, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've 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 discussed this with with countless numbers of officials. I myself at Harvard had professors who were cold warriors, remember the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, old and experienced, and they said, "Oh, Mark." You know, you have no idea how worried we are during the 1990s that Russia will collapse just like the Soviet Union. And I always wonder why, why would you? And, and there, you know, so there are so many voices now there, you know, there's Janusz Bogajski writing about the collapse of Russia's yeah. fail states and others. But again, you're right. There's a psychological barrier. You mm -hmm. know, and of course, the Russian propaganda is playing with the prospect of uh, nuclear terrorism, Islamist yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, organizations taking over uh, Russian nukes. So, you know, I know... I know quite well how 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 um, uh, they are able to influence the West uh, in that regard. Okay, let's say Putin. You know, there are some interesting questions on um, on the future uh, of of Russia. Let's just spend a couple of minutes. Let's say you know they lose the war. You know, the regime collapses somehow. Uh, do you think uh, the West will give will let Russia off the hook the way they did the Soviet Union with no reparations? I mean, and compared to what what Germany had to go through after the war. I mean, no need to repeat that the the you know the information mm -hmm. campaigns, the reparations, mm -hmm. all the shaming and blaming and naming everything. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union didn't go through any of that, and on top of that, mm -hmm. Putin claims that they were actually humiliated by the West. They were not. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you think there there will be always a temptation in the West to you know let's forgive them? They're now democratizing. I mean, I'm I'm speculating; it's hypothetical, but this seems to be a trend. Would you agree or would you disagree? Yeah, I would agree. In fact, I've offered three uh, potential scenarios about how the situation could unfold both in Ukraine and in relations with Russia and in Russia itself. Um, I think it's important to, which is just a, uh, another, uh, let's say, fragment of my, of my thought here, but I think it's important to position ourselves um, and, and think in terms of scenarios. There is no such a thing as a linear course of action. So for different scenarios, um, Russia being in turmoil, the Putin system collapsing, um, internal upheaval, um, converging, diverging groups fighting with each other, another smuta, as we say in Russia, mm. yeah, is a scenario I personally consider likely not tomorrow and the day after, but at some point, because it's pretty obvious that the system already has a number of cracks, yeah? uh, even though the propaganda tries to suggest that it's stable and uh, Putin has everything in or rather under his control. Um, but I don't believe this for a minute. Yeah? Um, so there will be some more cracks to come uh, and there will be probably turmoil. Um, perhaps even... And that could be another scenario. We will see a repeat, a modern type of 20, uh, sorry, 1917 repeat. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, if you look at the so-called uh, power structure, power struggle, sorry, power structures in, yeah. in Russia. If you'd look at um, the intelligence services, the armed intelligence services and the armed forces, uh, the other services including you have at least 20 25 plus different armed factions yeah they could eventually uh start in inner fighting we don't know um so yeah turmoil i would argue is certainly a scenario which entails a number of plausible elements but your question was what about us should we continue insisting on there is um, time for not payback, but there is time for bringing people to justice. Absolutely, because this is our core value. I mean, if we keep on, if we if we basically say no, no, I mean, uh, this is uh, not feasible. It's not practical. It's not doable. I already hear people saying, "Oh, we'll end up with another Versailles syndrome," and that's mm. 
yeah, that's a very dangerous and we must not humiliate Russia and so on and so forth. Yes, you hear these type of arguments, but they're a nonsense. If we stick to our own values, to what we really believe in, of course, we must bring people who committed crimes, in particular war crimes of that volume, of that, that dimension. We need to bring them to justice. We need to make them pay and in a proper manner, yeah, through courts, through proper procedures. And unfortunately, unfortunately enough, we have a couple of, not too many, but a couple of examples where the international community ultimately succeeded in bringing people to justice. If I think, for instance, of the, you know, the Balkans war, uh, mm -hmm. Serbia, uh, or a couple of African leaders who also thought they could get away. Um, and yet 10 years until later, they found themselves um, facing a, a special war tribunal. So, yes, we do have these type of precedents, and I think we need to stick to that line. Excellent. I have. I know we've we've yeah. uh, reached the uh, forty five yeah. minutes past the yeah. hour. But if you have, uh, uh, I don't know, five or ten minutes more, I have a couple of good questions that I want to ask you about NATO and Germany, mm. if if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for 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 your the additional time. So the question on on, on NATO is uh, is really straightforward. What to do about uh, uh, this um, uh, paralysis of decision making when someone like say the government of Hungary. Uh, decides to be difficult, you know. Is there a, should we have a mechanism in place to actually overcome such block blockage, you know, blockages? Yeah. Uh, good question, and something that I would put very much on top um, of a NATO reform agenda. Um, NATO has been reformed um, a number of times. I participated in some of these internal reform endeavors myself, um, but. It was. It never went as far as it should have been, namely to also reconsider, at least modifying in some ways, the core principle that governs NATO, which is the principle of consensus. Yeah. And as long as you have this holy cow, if I can call it like that, sacrosanct, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't even want to talk about, don't even want to discuss it, you have a problem. The European Union is a little bit more advanced. I mean, at least they have started to debate internally the introduction of uh, majority voting. And I think at NATO, um, not today, but perhaps with the yet to be appointed new secretary general, there will be hopefully some momentum, some political willingness to look at some these, these sensitive issues um, that really uh, that, that are so important. Um, I'm not arguing that we must get away with the consensus principle in total, but as you already pointed to the other day, journalist uh, said rogue states with a NATO. Yeah, he asked me about Hungary and Turkey. I thought that was a little bit too much, but um, let's say difficult states, states, member countries, governments um, who very openly sympathize with Russia and have a very close relationship. Uh, the minimum, the absolutely minimum that the other countries would need to do is to find a find space in a discreet form. I mean, to talk about what they could do in order to impress these countries. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking, for instance, financial funding. I'm talking programs. I'm talking military support. I mean, there are avenues, instruments, and tools that the others could use in order to pass the message to these countries uh, at hand saying, you know, membership is not cast in stone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, what we are lacking is the momentum. And yeah, that's uh, one of the things um, that, um, yeah, I'm pestering my former colleagues with, because I really think, I mean, they need to become a little bit more bold, yeah, in, in terms of approaching these issues. And grow backbone, as we say in, in America, you know. <laughs> 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 Not talking yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah, but let me, let me just add one more sentence, yeah. I mean, we've seen that with the accession, or rather the invitations for Finland and Sweden, mm. yeah. I mean, we have two countries 
who kept the other two hostages, political yeah. hostages. Um, that's nothing um, which you can just ignore and which you can just, you know, put some nice pastry on and say, oh, oh, oh and, you know, Sweden will become a member of, of NATO eventually. Yes. And perhaps no, if Mr. Erdogan has a bad day and then what? Yeah. So, no, we have a principal problem with these two countries. Um, and I think it needs to be addressed heads on. Excellent. Uh, another uh, question on uh, reforming NATO, actually making it stronger, a link to actually public diplomacy, something you were mm -hmm. in charge of uh, back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, and of course, uh, also strategic communications. Uh, you know, my, my good friend Mark Lady, obviously, it was, was moving mountains, yeah. you know, back in the day at, at, at Shape. Um, and but you, you, for the reason I'm asking, and also there is a question of that is that you mentioned how uh, President Biden keeps telling things like, okay, no fly zones, we'll do this, we'll, we won't do that. My former boss, General Hodges, always says, don't tell Putin what we, the US yeah. and NATO, will not do. Can yeah. keep him guessing. Yeah. So, do you think any, do you see any hope that, that they will, you know, uh, some sort of a strategy can be implemented at the NATO level at least to, uh, both combined, you know, obviously the requirements of public policy, yes, public officials have to tell the truth, but we are in a hybrid war with Russia. So how do we square those, you know, I mean, the, the, the exigences of truth telling and obviously the, the need to prevent our enemies from know our, knowing our plans? Uh, another super good question. Well, I mean, there is no way that NATO as an organization can influence strategic messaging messaging coming from Washington or Berlin or other countries. Um, if President Biden decides uh, to carry certain messages, even though we may not like them because we think they're counterproductive or they even invite President Putin to do this and that, there is no way that NATO, the apparatus, can actually influence that. Um, how to raise awareness that this is counterproductive? Yeah. <laughs> Especially, I mean, yeah, it's the magic, the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. The magic spot. That's yeah. Uh, that's that's another issue. Uh, I fear even though I don't have uh, any more insights on a day-to-day -day basis in my former division, but I think they have received pretty narrow-minded instructions. I mean, if I look at NATO languages these days, if I look at speeches being given, I don't want to sound too critical, but I would never, ever go around and, and give a talk by saying we are the most successful alliance in history. I would not start a conversation by that. Not with a war going on in the midst of Europe, the largest war and the, you know, most dramatic war ever since the end of the Second World War. NATO's deterrence has failed. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it has failed. So, um, but that's my personal my personal thing, I uh, just to get straight, probably as a last remark, I still happen to be a dedicated transatlantist, <laughs> even <laughs> though some of you may not have uh, believed after I've been so critical. I really believe in the transatlantic alliance. I believe really that it makes a lot of sense to coordinate your security policies and your military defenses. And there is a big, big um, advantage to a uh, defense clause, yes, yeah. But I think if you look at multilateral institutions like NATO, which are at the end of the day also run by people and are big bureaucracies, one has to be critical in order to make them better. And that's one of my driving um, yeah, motivations behind. Yeah. Uh, last question. I know we got to let you go. In the context of the Titan Vende, you know, is it how does it align, align with your canon strategy, canon inspired strategy? What should Ukraine do to use to leverage the Titan Vende to get more support, military, political from Germany? 
sent um, to Mr. Pistorius and to Mr. Scholz, sent him a couple of copies of Mr. Cannon's book. I'm under the impression, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Um, I'm not under the impression that they even consider mm. taking lessons learned from the Cold War. Mm. I don't think any one of them has read the long telegram. Probably I'm now arrogant. I didn't mean to come across like that. But um, we need to operate uh, in our discussions, in the political discussions, on our level, whoever we have, wherever we have interactions, even at the top political level, we need to be very clear what we are talking about. And if you want to advocate a containment strategy, we need to call it a containment strategy. And we need to make the case for that. And we need to put up the arguments. And if sending um, a copy of the long telegram is, is helpful, then we send a copy of the long telegram. At least this is what I do. <laughs> so, so I can only encourage you uh, to uh, eventually consider doing the same. <laughs> And of course, we need to add to this a copy of your book, which uh, I know is making ripples in Germany, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Uh, with this, Stephanie, yeah. I cannot thank you enough for uh, everything that you're doing for Ukraine. Uh, I mean, everything that you've done throughout the years and everything that you are uh, planning to do still. Um, we at American University of Kiev are privileged and honored to, to have had you as a, as a speaker. Uh, you see all the hearts flying, all the applauses that you got. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, thank we... you all. My heart belongs to you. If there is anything I can do for the AU, for you, Mark, you let me know. We remain in touch. Um, and yeah, be all safe. And no, you are not alone. <laughs> thank you very much. And you're always welcome to, to also come and visit us. See Behind me, you see the virtual walls of uh, American University of Kiev, the renovated uh, river port uh, on the banks of the beautiful uh, uh, Dnipro, you know, we would love to host you uh, in person next time yeah. you're in Kiev. And, Definitely, and I will come. Definitely. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. We'll be in touch regarding your we book, best. of course. All the best okay. of you. Stay, stay healthy. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay. Okay. With this, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, especially our students, I remind you that uh, we had this fantastic talk uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Stephanie Bobbs. Uh, next uh, week, we have uh, two more AUK talks, uh, one on Friday with um, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, uh, John Herbst, uh, and the second one on Saturday with the uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, uh, a, a four-star German general, uh, Chris Badia, uh, who will talk about NATO's transformation uh, for the future, to, to meet the future challenges. Uh, with this... Um, I wish you all a good night or a good evening uh, or a nice, have a nice evening, brother. Stay safe um, and I will see you all uh, next week. Thank you all. <laughs>